Welcome to the last session uh, of our conference agenda. The whole of the session is uh, on tomato brown goose fruit virus uh, and we have three presentations first followed by a quick Q&A session at the end so please put your questions in the chat uh, as you're listening to all three presentations so we won't pause we'll just go from one to the other until we get to the end and then we'll have a, a, a group chat at the end. Uh, firstly, uh, I need to thank De Reuter for sponsoring this final session and we have a short video uh, from our sponsor uh, first before we start, so enjoy the video. This is the time, the time to be part of something new, something big, something with purpose and opportunity. Together, we can make a greater impact by providing delicious and nutritious vegetables people want and need. This is what drives us. This is what inspires us to create new products, new innovations, and most importantly, successful partnerships. It's time to join together to ensure every vegetable grows beautifully, harvests efficiently, and transports easily for a better, more sustainable future. A future that is healthy for the world and healthy for business. The success of your business means the world to us because your success means so much to the world. Let's grow better together. Okay, thank you. I'm now going to welcome Adrian Fox from Thera Science Limited to uh, give a first presentation on this subject. Uh, w welcome, Adrian. Uh, the floor Hi, is yours. Thank you. Um, yeah, I was just saying to Phil in the run up to the session that in the time I've been associated with the Tomato Growers Association, I don't remember a single pathogen issue taking up a full session at three consecutive conferences. So that really does highlight um, how how major this issue is to the industry, to me. Um, and yeah, to, to to paraphrase from the uh, from the video we've just seen from our session sponsor, when they said be part of something big, I'd hoped it wasn't something big like this. But um, we'll we'll do our best to to help out as we go. So um, today I'll be. Talking about dealing with tomato brown ghost fruit virus in the UK, if anyone's seen the presentations I've given over the past year or so, this is partly an update on our ongoing um, AHDB work that we've been doing. But just to, to start off, um, we'll there we go. Um, I'll give you a quick reminder of how we got here. I think probably brown ghost fruit doesn't need too much of an introduction these days. And then I'll just go through our project updates. Um, we've just come to the end of the extension to PE033, which is the survival and disinfection work. Um, we're coming to the end of PE034, which is the spread and detection work. And we've just started PE035, which is taking a slightly different um, approach to diagnostics. So I'll talk about that at the end. So brown ghost fruit virus, um, it's a virus that can overcome uh, the TMV resistance genes that are in tomato um, and also some of the resistance genes that are in pepper as well. And it was first recorded in Jordan and Israel back in 2014-15 in and I say it's also been recorded on pepper. Uh, once plants are infected they cannot be cured, um, it spreads rapidly through a crop and it will spread through mechanical contact such as direct plant-to-plant -plant contact, tools, clothing and bumblebees and things like that. Um, and also now, since we last spoke, seed transmission has now been demonstrated. So we know that there's a seed transmission route in play and that can uh, facilitate entry into a system. And once it's in the glasshouse system, you've then got to think about mechanical contract, contact. And so really the best um, course of action to try and minimize spread and limit impact of something such as tomato brown ghost fruit virus is really to practice good hygiene measures and most of the work we've been doing is really just to support those good hygiene measures and try and work out so from our previous work we've done on pepino mosaic virus and potato spindle tuber viroid um, what other measures do we need to take or how does this virus respond to those measures that we, we previously developed 
I won't spend too much time on this slide. Um, I'm sure you'll probably see the same picture a couple more times this afternoon. But just the current distribution from that initial finding in Jordan uh, in 2014-15, we now have pretty much a, a spread east and west. Um, Southern Hemisphere, not too many reports, but certainly the Northern Hemisphere and the major smarter growing regions, we, we've got reports all over. And I think we've had nine further reports from Europe of, of first findings in countries this year alone. So the first project that we wanted to look at was just to try and sort out how robust this virus is, because we know that Tabamo viruses are incredibly robust, uh, but we didn't have that data specifically for tomato brown rugose fruit virus. And there may have been some differences between what we know for, for things like TMV and, and how we deal with brown rugose fruit virus. So we set up some uh, trial work to look at the survival of the, the virus and also the efficacy of disinfection approaches. And so our general approach was to inoculate a surface with uh, brown ghost fruit virus infected sap. And so uh, let's use the laser pointer. Um, so things like concrete, glass and, and hard plastics or picking trays, but also steel, aluminium um, and, and soft plastic polythenes as well. Um, and so once we'd inoculated them, if it was the survival work, we would then just wait a period of time. Um, if it was the disinfection work, we would treat with the disinfectant. And then following that, we would swab using uh, just a, a little cotton bud. And we'd put this onto a test plant. And those test plants, uh, Nicotianas, develop local lesions when they come into contact with um, a Tabamo virus, and in this situation, tomato brown rugose fruit virus. So what we're doing here is we're actually demonstrating that the virus that we're picking up is still transmissible. So we'd wait for three weeks for symptoms to develop, and then as a double check on those symptoms, we would confirm by ELISA. And within that process, because as I say, these symptoms can be generic to all Tabamo viruses, we did a routine double check using real-time PCR to ensure that symptoms were actually the result of brown rugose fruit virus and not something like TMV or, or tomato mosaic virus in, in the process. So our initial, uh, glasshouse surface survival work. Um, as we've shown, I've talked about this before, but what we showed here was that the virus can survive for at least a month on, on most glasshouse surfaces, um, and then sporadically it, it would still be detectable and transmissible from those surfaces up to six months af after that initial work. So the first thing we wanted to do was to look at the heat treatment of trays. Um, obviously, because um, picking trays are part of the food production system and the last thing you really want to have is um, things like uh, disinfection residues kicking around and some of the disinfectants we're looking at um, are linked to residues. We wanted to look at uh, non-chemical treatment, certainly for further picking trays. So the first thing we did was this hot water soak treatment, where we looked at 70 degrees and 90 degrees. And what we know historically from other Tabamo viruses is that um, around five to 10 minutes at 90 degrees should denature the virus. So we initially looked at this hot water soak, and we did find that at five minutes soak at that temperature, that did, did uh, denature the virus, we couldn't get any transmission. But then there's always that question, because we've used a hot water soak approach, is it the, the hot water soaking that's, that's giving you the effect rather than just um, a, a straight temperature kill, if you want to think of it that way? And so we, we did this work here, and this is in the, the, the extension work, where we looked at the effect at different temperatures and to see whether we could actually confirm that that 90 degrees was the thermal inactivation point. And as we see here, at 85 degrees for five minutes, you get some reduction in infectivity, but by 90 degrees, you, you're getting um, a, a complete denaturing of that virus. And so we're, we're happy that 90 degrees for five minutes should be enough to denature the virus and prevent onward transmission. And that can then feed back into things like the steam treatment of trays in, in terms of how to clean up those, those trays within the system. We then went on to look at a range of disinfectants. And again, I've talked about most of this work before in terms of the, the uh, material we didn't present at the, the last uh, year's conference. The, these two disinfectants, so Unifect G and Viracid, um, came up within discussions. Certainly the, the Viracid 
uh, was looked at within an American paper, um, and it wasn't a, a disinfectant that we previously looked at. But both Unifect G and Viracid are glutaraldehyde uh, and quaternary ammonium compounds, uh, mode of action treatments. So we wanted to include those within our extension work. Um, and certainly the Americans found that, that Viracid was effective at controlling um, the virus. However, with their work, they looked at what I would call a wet disinfection approach. So adding the disinfection straight to sap. Um, and they also looked at some um, concentrations of disinfectant, which were above the, the label rate. And so in each case here, we've gone for label rate or manufacturer's recommended rate. Um, and also we're looking at the effect of the different glasshouse surfaces on, on control of the virus. And so here's our overall results. So this is uh, putting inoculum onto the different surfaces, uh, treating with disinfectant and leaving it for 60 minutes to, to see how effective that is. And as you can see here, um, concrete is, is a bit of a challenge, but generally speaking, Vercon S, um, Huasan at the fogging rate, and the two glutaraldehyde uh, quarter and ammonium compound treatments were all effective at um, denaturing the virus. And we then stepped on from that to try and set a, a minimum exposure time for these products. And what we found was that Vercon has a similar efficacy to the 60 minute treatment at 20 minutes. So we think for, for Vercon S at 1%, that 20 minutes exposure uh, should give you um, effective inactivation. Again, apart from on um, porous surfaces like concrete and the Unifect G has that same efficacy at 10 minutes exposure. The other piece of work we did under the, the extension is to look at the detectability of the virus following treatment. Because obviously, if you've had um, an outbreak, the one thing we want to do is try and show that your cleanup procedures have been effective. And what you find is that here we've got CT values. So this is our real time PCR test. This is our molecular standard test that we use. Um, and then what we also did was uh, to take a swab, test the swab by, by real-time PCR, but we also so swabbed that onto test plants as we've done for the rest of the work to see whether you get transmission of the virus. And what you find is that here with the Unifect G, we can still detect the virus even after treatment, even though the virus isn't transmissible and isn't detectable on those test plants. So. There is a word of caution that um, we can't use a diagnostic approach post um, infectivity to, to try and determine whether a glass house is now free from the virus. We'll have to use something like a biological approach to back that up as well. And we saw similar results with Vercon S. So the other bit we need to talk about are the diagnostic developments. Um, so again, since we last spoke, there's now an an EPO standard on detection of tomato brown rugose fruit virus, uh, and that EPO protocol was published, and it includes a series of different assays that are recommended for detection of tomato brown rugose fruit virus from both seeds and plants. Um, and it also includes the uh, ISF primers from the International Seed Federation work, but it doesn't include their bioassay requirement. So it, it's just a straight detection rather than a detection and proof of, of transmissibility. And all of these tests have been ring tested under the Valley Test project. Um, and that Valley Test project really dictated which of those tests were included within that first draft of the EPO standard. Um, and there's also been a proficiency test on leaf detection organised by the European Reference Laboratories. And that helps labs involved understand their own testing capabilities. Um, and what we found was that there were some issues with the competency of labs that were unfamiliar with the pathogen. And that really came down to the caution needed to avoid cross-contamination. And I think whenever you talk to people who are experienced with this virus, that risk of cross-contamination in testing is something that comes up time and time again. Um, and that's something I'm, I'm happy to talk about at length. Um, but what we're just going to say is that those EPO methods have also been written into the EU regulations on surveillance for tomato brown and those fruit virus. So we've got a, a linked system here where the regulatory side and the diagnostic side are working hand in hand to both um, strength, stress test the, the diagnostics and also put those into place in regulation. 
So in terms of how we're currently testing, um, I'll briefly gloss over this slide because we'll, we'll come back to some of these elements in a moment. But we've basically got four sample types. So there's the single leaf, there's the fruit, there are seed samples, which we do for phytosanitary compliance testing. But in terms of the regulatory work and most of the regulatory work we do that would affect uh, UK glasshouse growers, there's the glasshouse survey, which is 200 leaf samples, uh, 20 times 10 leaves. Um, and what we know is that we've got these possible outcomes uh, where if you get a strong signal and you can confirm it with different methods, we're happy that's a positive. If it's a very, very weak signal, we consider that a negative, but you've got this, this room in the middle where um, I think we've said here further work required. And what we wanted to do was really focus in on these two areas to try and work out what's going on in terms of the virus development within the plant, how that relates to what a, a grower or an inspector might see um, in terms of um, their experience within the glass house with infection spreading, uh, and, and just what does it all mean? How do we make better sense of it? And how do we feed that back into the system? So we, we launched into PEO 34, the detection of tomato brown ghost fruit virus in plants. And so we, what we wanted to look at was the infection cycle. So going from uh, the point of infection through the development of, um, of infection within the plant, but also the development of disease. And those two things are not necessarily the same thing because the way the virus develops may be independent of whether you see symptoms or not. So we wanted to look at development of symptoms in, in two common UK varieties, and we also wanted to look at that over time uh, to see where to detect in the plant the most reliable results so we can feed that information back to the APHA inspectors. But what we wanted to know was that the type of crop and the type of variety didn't have any bearing on, on the advice we were given. So we looked at a winter lit crop and a spring crop. Uh, there were two glasshouse co conditions um, one that we infected early, so that's in terms of entry to the glass house, and one that uh, com comes in later on. So we looked at nine weeks later when you've got a relatively mature crop uh, and infect then. In each situation, we inoculated, inoculated one leaf of each plant with tomato brown ghost fruit virus, um, and then we sampled material from the, the top, middle, or bottom, and that was literally split the plant into three and go towards the growing head for the top, somewhere in the middle of the plant, or somewhere around the, uh, the point that we initially inoculated, but not that inoculated leaf. And we took samples at regular intervals, which were quite contracted early on. And then as, as the time went on, we spread that out until we could get 18 weeks worth of testing. And we also took samples from fruit, sepals, roots, which were also tested. And everything was tested by real-time PCR to monitor for virus concentration over time. And we also recorded leaf and fruit symptoms. So that's a long way around saying uh, what we actually did, but here's the results. And so this is our winter crop with early infections. So this was inoculated uh, very early November. And what you can see is that around, um, oh sorry, what I would say here is I, I talked about that 30 CT value where we get those inconclusive results. So I just put that across each graph to, to make it easy to see what's going on. And what you find is that regardless of whether it's Piccolo or Returno, what you have is that around two weeks, you start to see uh, robust detection of, of infection um, in that upper part of the plant. A couple of weeks after that, you then start to see um, detection in the middle of the plant. And then another couple of weeks after that, you're seeing it in the lower part of the plant in those mature leaves. So potentially, depending on where you sample a plant, you could have um, up to a month between robust detection at the top of the plant in the growing tips and in the mature leaves at the bottom of the plant. So it, it really is crucial to try and get that message across. If we look at the summer crop, uh, the middle of this graph is a bit more messy. Um, that's because one of the plants didn't take infection. So we need to clean that out of the data. But again, at that upper part of the plant, you see a very similar pattern of, of development, regardless of variety, um, and then probably slightly quicker in the lower part of the plant in the summer crop but again you're still looking at two to three weeks or even more before you'll get detection in the, the lower part of the plant 
And so the, the take home message there is that the earliest detection of infection that we had was 14 days after inoculation. That was the same in the winter and spring crop. Um, it's not dependent on the variety that we're looking at. Um, so our advice there would be to sample from the upper part of the plant if possible. Where things get a bit more complicated is if you then look at the, the late infection. And, and this is work we're still completing for the, for the second crop. But certainly, as you'll see here, um, these are averages across all four plants of each cultivar. I've got another graph in a second that will help shed some light on this. But as you'll see, you know, you're potentially 10 weeks in on average before you'll see detectable levels of infection um, in the upper part of the plant. And in some cases, even though we're happy that some of these plants are infected and we're not convinced that other plants are, um, you, you may never get above that detect, robust detect, detection level if you've got a late infection. So if we strip out the, um, the potential negatives and just look at the definite positives in that work, and this the ink is still wet on this. I, I literally put this together while the, the guys from APHA were talking earlier. Um, so here we can see that with some of the plants, you get to a, a definitive level of detection uh, at about 11 weeks. Um, and again, for some of the plants, even though we're convinced that these are infected, um, you get repeated levels of detection. Um, and that really then bounces on to say that actually in some of those plants, you may never get the level of detection that you're confident about saying that that's definitely infected. And so here we see that this, yeah, for, for two of the, the plants, the return 05 and the return 07, we got to robust levels of detection, but this piccolo plant, although we did bounce around that, that level of robust detection, we, we never got to somewhere that was really convincing. Um, and with these plants, the earliest detection of infection was about 49 days after point of inoculum. So here you can see that you've got um, potentially several weeks where you could have infection in your glass house and not be able to robustly pick up that, that virus. So as I said, that work is just coming to the end. I think we've, um, we're have we due to wrap up at the end of, end of September, beginning of October. Um, and so for the summer crop late infection point, we've got one sample point still to go. Um, and that's about eight weeks worth of samples still to test. So if you think about what I was saying about contamination, uh, given that we're doing seed testing for import and export, we're doing the 200 leaf samples from the glasshouse surveys, the last thing I want to have is material from this trial going through the lab at the same time that we're doing that that real testing and so what we've been trying to do is just pace out the, the different bits of testing as well as we can so that we don't um, hit the lab with lots of brown goes fruit virus inoculum all at the same time we we can then clean down before we do some some more what you might call real samples um, we've got the testing of sepals fruit and roots to complete and um Photos, photos, photos. We've taken pictures at every stage in each glass house of all the plants. I think we've currently got around 1,600 pictures taken, and these are now being sifted and sorted by crop and variety and point of infection. Uh, and what we would say is there's a, pretty much a good feeling that leaf and fruit symptoms are more pronounced on the summer crop than on the lit crop. Um, but again, we'll, we'll try and tease some of that out as we go. So just to return to that plant testing, uh, one of the problems we've got is, as I said, that 200 leaves is um, out of how many thousand plants is pretty much a needle in a haystack. Even though the statistics support those levels of testing and those levels of, of testing are in compliance with international standards, um, it still feels like it, it's not enough. But if you then start racking up the number of leaves, the amount of testing that's involved, the amount of work that's involved for inspectors becomes astronomical and it becomes quite difficult to manage. And what we do know is for some feedback, we've had some strong positives detected where there were no symptoms evident at, at time of sampling. So symptoms are not a reliable measure of infection. We've also had some, some weak positives across multiple real-time PCR tests, which couldn't be confirmed through a secondary method due to the lower sensitivity of that secondary method. And we wonder if some of these are those, those late infection situations. And so what we'll continue to do is we'll report the following outcomes. We will give a negative 
where something is quite clearly negative, we will give an inconclusive where you're in that, that gray area, and we will give a clear positive when we can confirm across multiple different methods, including those lower sensitivity methods. So just to wrap up this part of the talk, uh, the question is, where do we go from here? What next? So really what I want to do is work out a way to empower inspectors and growers so that they're not waiting for an inspector to come along and take 200 leads and then deliver the bad news if, if they've got an infection. What I'd like people to do is be in a position that they're actually actively able to monitor for themselves or inspectors can come into a glass house and get an idea of whether there's brown and fruit virus on the premises, which could then trigger an in-depth plant sample. And we think that LAMP, which is another um, detection method, but is amenable to on-site testing, could be the way forward for this. Um, and so we've partially validated LAMP for the seed and the plant testing. We're in the process of finishing that off at the moment. But that then raised the question of whether there were other applications for LAMP. So what we want to look at is these non-invasive diagnostic approaches. Um, so can you use LAMP to monitor large areas without using plants? And that raises the question of swab testing. And for several growers, we're already doing routine swab testing of their premises um, and things like high traffic areas, door handles, the canteen, places like that could, could be good areas to target for swab testing. And so we're, we're just at the very front end of a joint AHDB DEFRA funded project um, to, to have a look at whether we can validate and develop LAMP for, for this process. So what we've done so far is we've, we've looked at the potential risk points. And again, if you've seen me talk on this subject in the last couple of years, you're, you're no stranger to this, this slide. Um, but to look at things like where in the system would we want to try and target um, some kind of swab testing? So, you know, would you want to look at swabbing tools? Would you want to look at swabbing bee boxes? Would you want to look at swabbing crates, the canteen, and uh, things like door handles? And so the first thing we did was we've had a, a, a workshop with, with the growers to try and work out what are the, the best points that a grower might want to swab. And then what we can do is we can kind of distill those down to some key surfaces that we might want to look at. And so um, thanks to all the, the growers who took part in the workshop. Um, and so we, we have things like the, the obvious things like you know, people's hands, clothing and shoes. But again, mobile phones. And, and I don't know, any good grower will tell me that people shouldn't have mobile phones out in the glass house. But it, it's always a good one to check. Yeah, the, those canteen surfaces, even things like the computer terminals in the, in the, in the office. What I would say is if we've been doing a period of work where we've had lots of very hot samples through, if we swab the computers in our lab, you can get very, very good detection of um, of, uh, of brown and ghost fruit virus on there. And obviously things like tools, scissors. And there's also a question about whether we can detect from irrigation water as well. So could we actually move into a, a more passive monitoring approach? So all of these things that are currently in the process have, have been looked at where in the process of finishing the validation um, and I think by the end of October we'll then be moving on to looking at things like detection from irrigation water and, and, and swab samples. So finally I'd just like to thank the guys at, at Ferro who've actually done this work so Anna who's been leading on the, the disinfection work, um, Amy who's been doing a lot of the molecular testing along with Kinder and Rachel who's been doing a lot of the uh, biological assay work as well. I'd also like to give a, a lot of thanks to the Brown and Fruit Virus Steering Group. Uh, throughout this they've been absolutely invaluable in making sure that this work is, is grower focused and, and delivers what we hope it will deliver so that the, the industry can help to fight this virus and also I'd like to thank the HDB and DEFRA for, for funding this work as well. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Adrian. Uh, absolutely fascinating. Loads of questions coming in. We'll obviously pick them up at the end. But you make a good point at the end there. Um, the industry has come together very, very well through what we are calling the COBRA group, the, uh, the, the, the steering group, which has brought growers with experience, growers that want to get involved with yourself and scientists and deaf and everybody together in a really unique, actually, very effective uh, group to find a solution to this major challenge. So thank you for that. OK, well, uh, if you can hang on there, Adrian, we'll come back to you uh, shortly. But now I'm going to ask uh, Dave Kay to join us. Uh, 
Dave, uh, you're going to talk about uh, agents scared us with what the virus is. You're going to try and hopefully give us some solutions to how to keep it clean and, uh, and prevent it being a problem on our nurseries. Yep, the floor is your circle. Cool. Thank you very much. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those who don't know don't know me, I'm my name's Dave Cam, a, a plant pathologist with RSKA. That's horticulture. Um, it's a pleasure to be back at the Tomato Growers Association conference for this year. And um, as Phil said, I'm going to be talking about um, managing tomato brown rubies, fruit virus, and glasshouse hygiene. So I've been involved in with tomato brown rubies, fruit virus for a few years now. Um, back in 2019, um, I undertook some trips to Europe, to Germany and the Netherlands, um, as well as Israel, to speak with growers there who've been affected by the virus or, or businesses that were um, planning um, to live in, in a, I guess, a world where the virus was going to be present. Um, and I produced a report from that, which is available online. Um, I've also, uh, in 2020, um, after we've had some outbreaks in the UK, I spoke with three growers um, about their experiences, how they managed the virus, what went right and what went wrong. Um, and again, that report is available as well. This year, um, my focus has been more on um, hygiene across all of protected edible and, and mushroom growers. Um, I've looked at why measures are in place, um, what gaps and obstacles prevent the implementation of best practice. And I've kind of combined all this today um, to talk with you about um, the topic of hygiene and, and tomato brown rugus root virus, um, because a lot of lessons that you can learn a lot of things that happen or are undertaken by um, other growers than tomatoes are quite similar to, to what you do. So it's interesting to see um, trends in things that potentially could be improved across the industry as a whole. So you'll recognise this graph literally from um, Adrian's slide. So I'm not going to focus on this too much either. Um, it's important to know where tomato brown rugus fruit virus is coming from. Um, the main point I want to make from this slide is that there are outbreaks active in 18 European countries. So I think it was back in 2014 or 15, it appeared in Israel and Jordan. It is not a disease of Israel and Jordan anymore. It is a worldwide concern. And we have had six outbreaks reported in the UK in commercial production to date. So the risk to British growers remains high, and we need to make sure that we do everything we can to prevent infections from occurring. So continue to protect your businesses by preventing introductions, but also it's really critical to have a robust plan in place should an outbreak occur. Um, I've spoken to a few people who have a rough plan, but really please do have, have a, um, a good plan in place so that once, if, if the worst happens and you do get an infection, you can hit the ground running. And one of the ways of doing this is to make sure that you maintain your hygiene and biosecurity. So what is site hygiene and biosecurity? So you'll all already know what this is, but to, um, to give an overview, it's to prevent the introduction of potentially harmful pathogens, pests and weeds from entering onto your sites to preserve plant health. Um, and where outbreaks do occur, actions to limit spread and reduce crop losses are needed. Today, I'm really just talking about tomato brown rugus fruit virus. Um, and with any hygiene and biosecurity, Anything you've taken proactively is going to be the most effective measure. Um, it's easier to, to stay clean and keep clean than to deal with outbreaks. And there's this old adage, an ounce of prevention is, a, is worth a pound of cure. I would argue with tomato brown rugus fruit virus, um, an ounce of prevention is probably worth a ton of cure because prevention really is um, so important for this, for this disease. So it's really important to identify sources of um, introductions onto sites, because once you've recognised those, then you can start to address those to mitigate against them happening. And as Adrian uh, mentioned, contaminated seed is a concern, and we do now have um, conclusive evidence that seed transmission does occur. Um, we've also got the risk of, um, for main crop growers, infected plants coming in from propagation. Introductions can also come from visitors and staff, um, probably also from visitors, um, as well as contaminated equipment and machinery. And although not necessarily an introduction, 
disease carryover between seasons if you if you haven't done um, a comprehensive cleanup and haven't eradicated or deactivated the virus um, means that you might have viable inoculum on site which could infect um, young plants as soon as they've arrived. So looking at contaminated seed and in infected plants, um, and most of you will source your seeds from large commercial uh, large commercial seed producers. Um, and this is probably a good thing. They have the ability and the facility to um, ensure that their seed is kept clean, is, is tested and is confirmed clean to you. Um, so in many cases, hopefully, I think from discussions with the industry, most of you are fairly confident in the ability of um, seed producers. Um, and if there are concerns, seed, spare seed is often kept, which can be tested um, at a later date. Propagation, um, I wouldn't want to be a propagator. I think I've said that in the past is, uh, you know, it's a very difficult job, but similar to main crop growers, they're making every effort to make sure infections don't occur. It is, you know, core to their business. And um, I think you can visit some of the UK propagators now, but I don't think um, that's necessarily possible at the moment for um, propagators in, in the Netherlands and elsewhere. But you're not going to see from as Adrian's described, you're unlikely to see um, infection in plants at such a young age. Um, but many people ha have, have trust in their propagators that they are doing the right things um, to make sure that their plants aren't infected. So there is an element of trust. I guess if you if you are concerned at any point about your, your propagator, you, you can change in the future, but not, not necessarily for the upcoming batch of plants. Moving on to visitors and staff, um, workers and visitors pose a really significant risk of introducing or spreading the virus on and between sites, and you need to manage this. Workers, I guess, um, especially if you have a large proportion of your workforce on site, may not be so much of a risk of introducing it, but there's certainly a risk of spreading it around the, around the um, production areas. Visitors who can include um, other growers, um, sales reps, supermarket reps, uh, researchers such as myself, um, agronomists, advisors, um, contractors, you know, mechanics, they all will, will pose a, a significant risk. And one of the best ways of, of dealing with this risk is, is to control um, human behaviour, I guess. Um, so control where they go or, or certainly with staff, direct what they do and limit what they can do to reduce your risks. And this is really difficult. And I've spoken to a lot of growers about uh, managing staff in particular and, and their movement and that kind of thing. And really, there is a difference. And, and some people do it really well, whilst others don't necessarily um, do it as well. And the ones who um, are successful in this probably don't notice any benefit to this. But the ones who aren't probably do see, see issues arise. Just to raise three concerns with visitors and staff, um, cleanliness, including personal hygiene, um, restricting movement, so controlling that movement, as, and also effective training. So just to touch on cleanliness and personal hygiene for a minute, all of you will already um, tell your staff that you expect them to come in uh, with clean clothing um, each day, and, and the same, you know, I guess, is already kind of understood for visitors, um, especially those coming from other sites where they may have been working. Um, personal protect, protective equipment, clothing should be supplied to high risk individuals. So you should give those to visitors or, or staff who move between production areas where they're at greater risk. Um, I would advise you supply PPE in this way to um, visitors rather than rely on them to supply their own because their own supplies could be contaminated inadvertently. Um, but as a bare minimum, disposable gloves should always be supplied and changed as frequently as required um, for staff and visitors. But you can supply cotton over suit, shoe coverings and hair nets. Um, you know, I've had personal experience of shoe coverings and they are, they, they're not the best. So some businesses now go a step further <coughs> and provide boots to their staff and visitors. Um, these boots are waterproof, so staff can walk into a glass house, uh, you know, production area, wearing these boots through the foot dip, you know, good depth, so that they're making sure it's clean, and then they can change into uh, shoes, shoes that remain in that crop production area. 
so that they always so things are never taken out things aren't being walked around around the site in the same footwear and then when they leave that production area they can put those boots back on and go through um, for foot dip and boots are also being supplied to some visitors um, who may come frequently and before they arrive their boots are disinfected and after they leave their boots are disinfected just as a, an added precaution because generally speaking um, hygiene in, in glasshouse production and protect edible crops is really great um, you're already all pretty much doing the right thing and a lot of what I'm telling you today is common sense but there are little things now which can make just a little small improvements which all build up into a into a big improvement it's unlikely that we're going to see massive improvements in hygiene because it's you know it's been something that's been built on year and year and year similar to boots um, some sites provide um, t-shirts for staff um, this i suppose reinforces in their minds the importance of, of cleanliness um, it's an expensive option, one that not all businesses may want to do. Large businesses, it would cost cost quite a considerable amount. Um, you still have to make sure that the rest of their um, clothing is clean, the clean trousers, etc. Um, but this is an option that's taken up by some people. Um, in Israel, when I was out there, one of the uh, methods that some of the growers there are taking is very similar to prevent infection. Um, and introductions and they dress their staff in different colored boiler suits each day um, just to prevent um, to prevent introductions however once you've got your clothes on and they've got dirty contaminated um, maybe in a production area then there's a risk that can just um, spread the disease moving on to restricting movement uh, controlling movement is one of the most effective strategies to manage this disease if you if you go back and, and have a chance to look at the case studies and um, there was one site the first site in the uk which suffered disease tomato brown rigus root virus and it became restricted to one area because they restricted the movement of their staff so they were able to prevent it going to their entire site so controlling movement is really um, a good idea if you, if you can manage it and it's important to ask yourself a series of questions for any visitor you know are they essential? Do they need to be there at all? Um, perhaps you could do whatever you were going to do with them over Teams, you know, have a, have a chat over Teams, have a meeting over Teams. Or maybe they can just go to um, the conference room. Do they need to be in the crop? How can you access, how can their access be limited? Could you could you meet in the pub? Could you meet in a, in a local cafe and, and have a discussion? Similarly, do people need access now? Could they come later in the year? Um, if each visit is, is a risk point, reduce the number of visits you can do. Um, and you have to ask yourself, what risk do these, these visitors pose and how can this be reduced? Um, some of you I spoke with and, and you said, well, the best thing we could do would be to avoid all visitors completely. Um, and that won't always be possible, but certainly with um, tomato brown rigus fruit virus and, and as well as COVID, um, a reduction in visitors um, has been a, a successful strategy. And the final point I'll make here is, is providing ownership. So um, one grower I spoke to, they're obviously concerned about tomato brown rigus fruit virus. So they have very restrictive move, staff movement for the first three months of the year up until about March. And on this site, by restricting staff movement, and it gives people ownership of certain areas. And this not only has the benefit of hopefully preventing um, a high level of spread if the virus is present, but it also means that um, cropping areas owned, I suppose, by these individual staff members can be monitored. And if there are issues, they can be um, traced back if the issues later on, but they can receive additional training before the crop um, gets into peak production. And the high level of restrictive movement is, is eased um, after about March time, when the statutory surveillance programs under, underway, but also in time for when um, cropping cropping begins. So that kind of system works well for them. Uh, moving on to training, this, well, it doesn't matter whether you're a tomato grower or whether you're a, a different kind of protected edible grower, virtually everyone said the same thing and they see training as a potential weak spot in um, with any pest and disease um, and hygiene. So please ensure that your staff understand what they're being taught. There's a difference between um, learning and hearing, I guess. 
Um, and this is a really difficult time for all of you. Labour has been raised as such an issue and some growers have, have described their sites as result, revolving doors with one, one staff member in, one staff member out. But it is important that you spend some time if you can making sure they have a full induction and if you can train them on um, pest and disease identification and site hygiene and biosecurity, that's only going to, to benefit you. One grower who isn't a Tomasa grower, I should point out, um, is no longer bothering to train in pest and disease identification because they need to get their staff into, the, into their crops quickly. Um, I think that is a mistake. At the very least, you should be um, getting people to identify when something doesn't look right or when something's off because they can go and get someone else. Um, but I've spoken to growers who've said um, by spending a bit more time training their staff, they've identified issues such as russet mite early on before they were picked up by any monitoring staff, which meant that they could be proactive or get in their treatments earlier. So um, it is worth making sure that you train people. And refresher trainings are equally important. And the other point which was raised was that a lot of um, countries of origin I guess of your staff have changed in recent years and sometimes there's not even appropriate training materials for people from certain countries who speak certain languages so if you can get trans, um, presentations um, translated to the right so that everyone can have a chance to understand what they're being taught um, and then update your pest and disease posters your documents etc because the more people understand the, the better they'll be able to do their job Equipment and machinery, Adrian's already mentioned how transmissible tomato brown rugus fruit virus is and how important it is to clean and disinfect your machinery and equipment frequently. Um, certainly when you're moving anything between houses, um, you definitely need to give it a good clean down because you don't want to risk contaminating another place if you've got an infection, even especially if you don't know it. But also if you're going, trolleys may be going down between rows and you're concerned, you, you can certainly clean and disinfect them. Um, please maintain your hand shell stations. If you've got um, measures in place to improve hygiene, but they're not looked after, then there's no point in them being there. Um, foot and wheel dips, um, you need to keep them topped up with the right disinfectant at, and make sure that the activity is maintained. Again, if, it, if it's not doing its job, there's, it's just, you know, your feet are just going to get wet. Um, and make sure your wheel dips are big enough for a full rotation of, of whatever's going in there, a forklift. And um, several people reported that their staff like to jump over foot dips on the way out. I don't know why they want to do this, but perhaps make sure that you've got um, some means of, of preventing this. Um, similarly, any equipment you use to clean other equipment should be cleaned to make sure that you're not just, so to make sure it's effective, but also you're not risking contaminating anything. And I've written, remove excessive organic material um, dirt and, and mud um, takes longer to be to be treated by disinfectants. So if you've got mucky stuff, then your um, cleaning is not necessarily going to be as effective, which is why we clean and then we disinfect. Um, blades are really important to keep clean. Some growers have um, buckets where you soak a, a, a blade in disinfectant. So you use one blade going up and then you swap it for the blade that's in disinfectant and you use that going down. And that's just another measure of, of preventing spread. And um, make sure that your crates are clean, especially if, if things are coming in from other sites or, or even abroad where we've got so many outbreaks in places like Spain. So it's important to make sure that crates are clean. And one way of doing this is to um, invest in new equipment such as low pressure steam sterilization units, um, or we've got the hygiene lock on the image there it'd be very difficult for someone to jump that. Um, but these are expensive measures and maybe not possible for everyone. But sometimes just making sure you maintain what you've got, like the foot dips or uh, making sure they're wider so that you've got full rotation of the wheels and stuff, even little things can have big effects. So try and work out just um, every way that you can possibly improve hygiene and work out what works best for you as a business. Um, just going on to monitoring before I go on to crop turnaround. Monitoring is key. As Adrian said, it can be quite a long time before symptoms appear. Um, so keep monitoring your crops. It's unlikely you're going to see infection at, at arrival. Um, and please don't just rely on, on the statutory surveillance programme. And 
you know, it is important to look at symptoms, but as, as Adrian said, symptoms are not necessarily a reliable indication or um, measure of infection. So you can link monitoring to training, which is useful. Um, and if in doubt, you should send samples for analysis and quarantine suspic suspicious plants or areas. Don't, um, don't be cautious. You know, if you're worried about something, um, you know, Oh, sorry, be cautious. I don't know why I said don't be cautious. Be cautious. If you're worried about an area, make sure that you um, take it very seriously. And finally, as I mentioned at the start, have a plan in place to reduce risks after an outbreak has been confirmed because you, you need to be on the ground running. You can't, um, you can't have time or you can't afford the time to then have to develop a plan um, because it's critical you act early. So finally, moving on to crop turnaround, cleanup and site disinfection. With most pests and diseases, failure to eradicate um, them may lead them to carry over to the next season. Um, the transmissibility of and the survival of this um, virus, as, as Adrian talked about in the last presentation, means that it's really important that this is um, done well. And so you have to approach it methodically and carefully. Don't leave anything to chance. Think through each stage, which I know all of you already do. Um, try not to rely on contractors, that's that's easy for me to say, but try and do as much in-house as possible. That also will give extra labour to, to your currently existing staff, which, which might be a good thing. Um, contractors are a risk. One of the sites who suffered from um, Rugo's infection last year, or maybe the year before now, was worried it got bought in by a contractor. So if you can reduce people coming onto site, as I said, that's only a good thing. Many of you use mats which you roll down the rows, put the vines on, they get bought out. Um, one method a lot of you have told me you're doing this year is to use fresh mats. So if you're buying your own mats or buying a few this year, buying a few next year, um, and those of you who aren't buying are asking sites to supply new mats so you'll get the first use of them. But um, anything that gets bought on site, you want to make sure is being cleaned and disinfected. And if you can use your own, then you've got that reassurance. When you're shredding your crop debris, please do this under shelter. Don't do this outside. Don't do it where it's going to blow towards production areas. Um, certainly, if you have an infection confirmed, and then you just need to remove all your slabs and your cubes and your, and your leaf litter. And if you've had an infection, the best thing in my mind you can do is incinerate it. You might need um, certain permissions to do this. You can bury, deep burial, um, but incineration will be your best method of, of getting rid of it. And if you are storing it for any time, store downwind from production areas. Don't don't let anything blow up towards something that you've just cleaned. Clean and disinfect anything else. You know, you've got your screens, anything, everything needs wiping down. You never know where um, infected material might end up. And then replace and clean as much of, a disinfect, um, of the irrigation system as, as you see fit. Obviously, you can't replace the whole thing, but make sure that you you thoroughly clean it down and disinfect um, and you, you can replace. I've written here dispose of the plastic, don't reuse. Another issue facing you all is rising costs and a lot of you have said that you're not really sure you want to replace the plastic because it's doubled in cost this year. Um, I think if you've had an outbreak of tomato brand rigorous root virus you need to replace the plastic so please don't reuse it. And for those of you who aren't replacing your plastic this year but haven't had any tomato brand rigorous fruit virus issues, please do make sure that your clean down is as comprehensive as possible if you are reusing this plastic. Um, finally, the last bit on cleanup. Um, now's a good time to un undertake any necessary maintenance work. Um, and then any remaining crop debris you see needs to be removed. A lot of you use leaf blowers just to get it all down to the edge and, and sweep it up. Um, clean your glass. Next, under, under pressure, using a detergent, including the ceiling or, or roof. Um, not everyone I spoke to can actually do this. Um, so some of you are investing more in cleaning this in the glasshouse architecture this year, more so than you have done in the past. And people are investing in equipment such as robotic oscillating heads for hydraulic sprays. But the more you can clean, the better it'll be. And then finally, disinfect using an appropriate disinfectant at maximum labor rate. Um, Adrian's mentioned glutaraldehyde products, Vulcan S, Unifet G, and then replace the plastic. Um, and then, then hopefully you'll, you'll be set 
for, for the next year. Um, those people who've had tomato brown rugus fruit virus or, or people who are worried consider fogging as well as an additional reassurance. And some people do it once and some people even fog twice just, just to be on the safe side. But again, that, that's really down to you because you need to judge everything you do based on, on risks. So the last slide, um, just in summary, really, disease avoidance is critical. Please update your hygiene and biosecurity protocols regularly um, and develop site-specific action plans. Don't leave it or don't have half a plan in place. Please do have a, have a good, robust plan in place for an outbreak. Um, and then just, you know, we have to pray that that doesn't happen. Source clean seed and request young plants are tested at propagators. Um, hopefully, if they are tested at propagators, they would be able to test positive, but Adrian's slides are very um, interesting. And then monitor crops frequently and continue to routinely test your plants if you're uncertain. Don't rely on the statutory surveillance program. Um, if you're in doubt, just be cautious and test. Train your staff, as I mentioned, make sure that they understand what they're being trained in and consider having tomato brown rugus fruit virus champions. In, if you can't train everyone in all pests and disease, maybe have people who um, do look out for this, um, you know, individual people who, who look specifically for certain things. Restrict your staff movement and your visitor movement if they're on site and giving ownership of areas to staff I mentioned, and that, was, that has its other benefits. And then provide PPE gloves Consider laundered clothes, boots, um, and make sure your foot dips and your wheel dips are maintained and big enough. And then finally, just clean down with products that you know to be effective against tomato brand rigorous fruit virus and do this at the, at the maximum rates. And where possible, do as much as you can in-house um, and avoid getting people in. But I appreciate that isn't always possible. Um, and that pretty much covers what I want to talk to you about today. Obviously, there is, um, you know, there's a whole lot you can do. and I've only had 20 minutes to talk to you about that today. But, um, you know, just just keep going and don't take your foot off the pedal. Um, but I'd just like to thank the AHB Horticulture for funding all the work that I, I've discussed today. The Tomato Brown Rugas Fruit Virus Steering Group, um, Protect Edible Industries that I spoke with, and that's tomatoes, cucumbers, peppers, leafy salads and mushrooms and then other industry experts who, who fed into the work as well. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much indeed, Dave. Uh, yeah, a huge amount of work to do there. I mean, just, just the list alone is enormous. So uh, <laughs> thank you for going through that. And uh, I think it's both very helpful and terrifying at the same time. So uh, thank you very much indeed. Obviously, please hang on to the Q&A at the end and uh, I'll uh, speak to you very, very, very sh shortly. Thanks again. Okay, uh, we now move to uh, Matthew Everett from Defret, DEFRA, rather, who has the honour of giving the last paper of our conference this year. Matthew, thank you ever so much for hanging on. It was, uh, must be worse to be the last man in. I apologise uh, that it happens to be you this time. Make sure it's not next time. Um, <laughs> I'm looking to you just to look at the uh, leg legislative impacts of uh, this awful disease and, uh, and, and where we're up to now. So, uh, yeah, the floor is yours. Thank you, Matthew. Right, thank you, Phil. I'll just share my slide. Okay, hopefully everyone can see that. So, yeah, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name's Matt Everett, and I work for DEFRA in, in the area of plant health. And some of you may remember me from uh, this very conference a couple of years ago, as I also gave a presentation on the legislation and policy. Um, but a lot of lot has moved on since then. And in this presentation, I'll be going through where the legislation currently stands and some of the recent policy with regards to seed imports. But before I do that, I'll just put things quickly into context and why it's so challenging developing legislation for this virus. So first, as you know, tomato brand rigos fruit virus is a relatively novel virus, having first been observed in Israel in 2014 and subsequently confirmed in Jordan in the following year. Not quite as novel as COVID-19, it has to be said, but it's still quite a new virus. And that means we're still learning about the virus all the time, as you heard in Adrian's slide, in slides. Um, and we're 
working off incomplete information and that's that is a challenge when it comes to legislation it's also a rapidly developing situation and you have seen this map before we you can tell that we all adore uh, this map from the european and mediterranean plant protection organization i'm sure they could make some money off it probably given the amount of amount it's being used but yeah it's a rapidly developing situation going from a couple of countries in the middle east now to being spread over most of western europe as well as north america and parts of asia and it has been introduced into the uk with six outbreaks in tomato production sites in england five of those have now been eradicated there is one remaining uh, outbreak site but because of this rapidly developing situation we have had to adapt our legislation based on the movement of the virus geographically um, and you'll see examples later in this presentation where we've had to adapt our policies based on an increase in a risk in a particular area. But also we've had to adapt our legislation based on the efficacy of the legislation. If we're finding after we've introduced legislation that the virus is still spreading rapidly, then obviously we need to strengthen that legislation. Also, as you've heard, the virus is a very big problem, a very big challenge in itself. It's very persistent and very easily spread. As Adrian showed, it's very persistent on planting materials, plants and seeds, but also non-planting material for many months and possibly longer. And it spreads long distances in trade, in planting material, seed, and it spreads very quickly locally by mechanical means on people clothes, tools, bumblebees, trays, you name it. And all of these aspects of the virus's biology need to be taken into account when we're developing legislation. And also there has been a little thing called Brexit. Whereas previously we were under the watchful gaze of the European Union, we are no longer, and we have a lot more power over the legislation that we can introduce. But I will start from the very beginning, with, and it all began with the EU in 2019, where the EU Commission considered a pest risk assessment from Italy on the virus, and this pest risk assessment covered the pathways of entry of the virus into the country, into the EU. It covered the establishment potential of the virus, the impacts it would have if it was introduced, and it made recommendations as to what measures could be introduced to prevent the entry of the virus into a country. That was in June. And the EU Commission put together some measures based on that pest risk assessment, and those were approved in the following month. And the legislation came into force on the 1st of November, 2019. And as I mentioned a couple of years ago, this was extremely speedy for the European Union. It doesn't usually work so smoothly. However, there were some measures in this legislation that could be considered to be quite weak and perhaps they could have been uh, it might have been because of the limited knowledge with respect to the virus at the time still learning all the time uh, for example one of the measures was that you could import tomato and pepper plants and seeds from a country free of the virus or an area free of the virus now obviously on the face of it that does seem pretty good. Of course, you want to import your plants and seeds from a country that's free of the virus and an area free of the virus. But because the virus was spreading so rapidly between countries, um, uh, it's very possible that a country that was previously free of the virus could have had the virus, they just haven't detected it yet. And and, and so, yeah, so it's very, it's very possible. Um, and, and this is particularly the case given the very cryptic nature of the virus in seed, but also in young planting material. So basing um, your import measures just on that um, would be considered to be quite weak. And so in the following year, new measures came into force on the 15th of August 2020 and that repealed the legislation I was just talking about 
And these, this legislation was considerably stronger than those measures. Um, and it's worth pointing out that the UK did have quite a lot of input in strengthening the measures at the time, while we did still have a modicum of influence in the EU. But then Brexit happened, and we then transposed that legislation into our own Great Britain legislation. Um, when, when I say transpose, it just means transferring the legislation from the EU into Great Britain and basically changing EU to GB in, in effect. Uh, but Northern Ireland still has to follow these EU measures because they obviously follow different arrangements to the rest of the UK. So what does that look like in our own legislation? So this is quite a mouthful, but the relevant legislation is the Plant Health Phytosanitary Conditions Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2020. And the most interesting parts of that legislation, if you can call them that, are the schedules at the end. And I'll go through the schedules that are relevant to tomato brown rugose fruit virus. So you've got schedule one, which is the list of Great Britain quarantine pests. There are over 225 quarantine pests that we regulate, and tomato brown rugos fruit virus is one of those. And I'll go through what that means in a minute. You've got schedule six, which is the prohibitions, the plants and plant products that you cannot introduce into Great Britain. Schedule seven, which is the import measures, specific measures on plants and plant products from third countries. Schedule eight is the measures for movement within Great Britain. And then finally, schedule 10 is the plant, plant products and other objects requiring a phytosanitary certificate, which is our sort of health certificate for plants. So first of all, what does it mean to be a Great Britain quarantine pest? So to qualify, a pest must have a, an established identity, so a clear, clearly defined taxonomy, such as to species level. And if it, if it doesn't have that clear taxonomy to species level, then it can still qualify as a quarantine pest as long as it's very distinct from any other organism, so i.e. it produces very consistent symptoms on a particular crop. The pest must not be present in Great Britain, but if it is present in Great Britain, then it must not be widely distributed. So for example, if we have many localized outbreaks of the, virus, of, of the pest that are under eradication, it could still qualify as a quarantine pest. It must be capable of entering, establishing, and spreading within Great Britain. If it can't establish, it's not really a risk. We don't need to worry about it. it if it was to enter, it would cause unacceptable economic, environmental, or social impacts. And then lastly, there should be feasible and effective measures to prevent the entry, establishment, and spread of the pest. And because tomato brown rugos fruit virus qualifies, uh, or you know, fulfills all of those criteria, it does qualify as a quarantine pest. And that means to, that tomato brown rugose fruit virus is prohibited from being introduced into or moved within Great Britain. And there are responsibilities on professional operators and persons other than professional operators. So if a professional operator does see symptoms in their crop, such as those on this slide, for example, and suspects tomato brown rugose fruit virus, then they must notify the competent authority, which would be us. So the best point of contact, as you've heard in the other two presentations, is the Plant Health and Seeds Inspectorate in the Animal and Plant Health Agency for England and Wales, whereas for Scotland, it would be the Inspectorate within the Agriculture and Rural Economy Directorate. And if tomato brown rugose fruit virus is suspected or confirmed, then action should be taken to prevent the spread of the virus. Moving on to the prohibitions, these are the list of plants and plant products that, that are prohibited from being introduced into Great Britain. And these are really, this is really a last resort measure. If, if other measures can't be put in place to prevent the introduction of a pest. Um, and one of the entries, um, which is relevant, uh, relevant or tomato brown rugose fruit virus is that plants for planting of Solanaceae 
other than seeds are prohibited from a number of countries apart from the countries shown in this slide. And it's worth noting that some of the countries that don't have to follow this prohibition are the EU member states. So now going on to the specific measures associated, um, associated um, with imports. And, and movement within Great Britain relating to tomato brown rugose fruit virus. So first of all, these measures relate to tomato, Solanum lycopersicum, and pepper, all capsicum species. There is an exemption for resistant varieties of pepper, so they don't have to meet the requirements I'm about to go through. There is no such exemption for tomato at the moment. So starting with seed, if you want to move tomato and pepper seed, import tomato and pepper seed into Great Britain, the seed must be accompanied by a five century certificate and it must fulfill both of the requirements here. So the mother plants of the seed must have been produced in a place of production that is free of the virus based on official inspections and the seed or the mother plants have been sampled and tested negative for the virus. So that's for the import into the country. In terms of movement within Great Britain, the measures are the same. The only difference being that instead of a phytosanitary certificate, a plant passport is required. Right, so there have been two policies uh, that have come into, come into play since the introduction of the legislation. So the first is that there is a derogation for seed that has been harvested prior to 15th of August 2020, where they do not need that inspection of mother plants during the growing season. And the reason for that is that 15th of August is the time when the legislation came into force. After that point, you can do the inspection of the crop. But before that point, if seeds have already been harvested, you can't really do the retrospective inspection of those plants. And so for this seed, you just need to do the sampling and testing and show it is negative for tomato brown rigus fruit virus. And this derogation will be allowed until the end of this year, but we will be reviewing it during the autumn to see whether we should extend it. The second policy that's more recent is around seed imports. So our current policy is that all tomato and pepper seed from third countries, including the EU, will be held and tested at the border if they meet the certain size requirements for inspections. Previously, EU seed was tested, but it was not held. So this covers all of it now. And the reason why we have this policy in place, I'll just give you a few figures here. So from July 2020 to June of this year, tomato and pepper seed represented 92.5% of all seed interceptions, including pest interceptions. So that's a very high proportion. And tomato brown rugose fruit virus represented 79% of all seed interceptions, also of an incredibly high proportion at the moment. So you can see there's a huge risk there. And as I mentioned, EU seed previously was not held, but because, um, because of this, this caused complications down the line where seed that has been infected, that is infected seed, has been moved to other premises and sometimes has been grown on. And, and, and obviously that causes a great lot of difficulties for us, but also obviously it's spreading the virus across the country. And so that's why we have, why there's good justification to hold this EU seed in line with all other third countries. And, and it also fits with the, uh, the International Plant Protection Convention principles of non-discrimination. There really isn't a good justification to discriminate against countries outside of the EU. There is a considerable risk from the EU as well. Okay, in terms of plants for planting other than seed, if you want to import tomato and pepper plants into Great Britain, again, they must be accompanied by a phytosanitary certificate. 
And those plants must arrive from seeds that have been sampled and tested negative for the virus. And they must have been originated in a registered production site known to be free of the virus on the basis of official inspection. And if those plants do show symptoms, they must be sampled and tested negative for the virus. Again, the measures for movements within Great Britain are the same, the only difference being that you need a plant passport rather than a phytosanitary certificate. And finally, just to mention that sampling and testing regimes for this material, seeds and plants, are stated in the UK legislation, or GB legislation it should be actually. Um, the seed sampling is based on an international standard, which is the methodologies for sampling of consignments. Plant sampling is largely based on the collection of leaves, and the testing requirements are largely based on real-time PCR. And so hopefully you will have seen throughout this presentation the difficulties, the challenges of developing legislation for a novel virus which is spreading rapidly, which is difficult to control in the wider context of Brexit. It is still relatively new legislation, relatively new policies. And so obviously we will be monitoring the efficacy of the legislation and whether there will need to be any changes going forward. But I'll end there and say thank you for listening and ha happy to take any questions. Matthew, thank you ever so much for that. I mean, and thank you not just for your presentation and for all the work that you're clearly doing, but your continued uh, dialogue uh, and communication with the TGA and with, and with our COBRA group. It's uh, invaluable that we link the problems, the possible solutions and, and the industry with legislation. It's, that's, it's vital we all work together. So thank you ever so much for that. OK, we are uh, overrunning towards the end of our, our conference, unfortunately. Um, but I don't know if the, the Wizards and the IT team can bring the other two people back in. Brilliant. Hello, Adrian and Dave. Thank you very much for uh, hanging on. We've got all sorts of questions here. Given time, what I'll try and do is sort of bring some of them together uh, and, and I'll share them out. Um, just because you've mentioned it last, Matthew, and I'm sorry you've just been talking, but you mentioned the seed issue there. Um, that links to one of the worries that I've always had. You've got control over what goes into the commercial world. What happens with amateur growers? You know, they share seed between themselves. I've given talks at uh, gardeners clubs over the years and it frightens me how they share, share material with no controls. <laughs> Yeah, that, that, I mean, that's just a very a, a concern for us in general, not, not just with regards to, to tomato and pepper seed, but also more generally, and is something that uh, I know is a sort of a key um, item of uh, to look into for the International Plant Protection Convention, for example. There's a huge amount of work being done on e-commerce e in trying to improve the relationships um, between countries and and postal services and custom and, and customs to to try and work out a solution because it's not easy to to regulate the, the seed um, obviously they have to follow the regulations but there's a lot that is very difficult to enforce and there's a lot of work going on trying to improve that situation and 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 we have been um, joining in with this work to try and improve that situation. But it's, yeah, it's something that is certainly on our radar and, and, and we are looking into it at the moment. Uh, it's good to know it's on your radar. Thanks for that, Matthew. Uh, okay, quick change. I'll give you a rest now. Um, Adrian, you've been quiet for a while. A little question that's coming with, I think, with your name on it really is, would you recommend individual growers do the testing to ensure that glutaraldehyde products have been effective? You know, it's uh, quite an expensive thing to do. It feels like you're doing the right thing. You fill a glass house full of fog looks brilliant, looks like you've got everywhere. Uh, is that something you recommend that we do and then we share that data with uh, plant health? I think for me, I, I think some of that swab testing, certainly as we go through the PO35 and we get a better understanding of what swab testing can offer, we'll be in a better position to answer that. Certainly we have some growers already who are using that as, a, as an approach to make sure that their premises are, are clean or continuing to be clean. And we've also got those who have, have unfortunately had infections and are trying to monitor the effectiveness of their cleanup. But the, the warnings there that just be a bit cautious that it's not just about the molecular result, 
if you've had a previous infection and we probably need a bit of a discussion about doing some kind of biological testing as well just to give that that peace of mind and it, would that be worth testing nurses that haven't had a an event that also cleaned up so to give you a background sort of base level if you like yeah, and that, that's what we're hoping to do over the, the course of the, the, the PO35 is just to get a better understanding of, of what the background looks like. Because when you start thinking about extraction methods and everything else, all of those are designed around seeds and plants. And obviously when you're doing it from straight buffer with just a, a bit of a swab in it, you may not get the same level of results. And things can appear much stronger than they, they may otherwise appear. Uh, well, that makes perfect sense. And leading on from that, I mean, is it, is it, obviously I know you're doing all to work globally, sharing that information. Is, is there anything popped out in this area from your, from your, your global conversations, or, are we, or is, is, it, are there, is the British team leading the way at the moment? I think certainly, I mean, if you look at things like the disinfection work, there have been lots of bits of work doing very similar stuff. Um, what we haven't had is any coordinated effort. So... On that front, there is a, a Ufresco project that's now been delayed another year, uh, which hopes to, to bring a lot of that disinfection stuff together. And the ultimate aim of that is to try and get single disinfection protocols to cover spindle tuber, viroid, and Baragos fruit virus, and anything else as well. So you can kind of bring all of those strands of work together. But as I say, one of the problems when you start looking at kind of the American disinfection work is they... They, they took a strategy that was, what's the quickest kill time, regardless of how much disinfectant I throw at it? Whereas we kind of went, you know, use a bigger gun, I think is the, the, the phrase you'd use there. Whereas our approach was, well, what's, what's the lab, maximum label rate and how long does that take to work? Um, and so it's just trying to bring all that together. But I mean, we had a conversation at the steering group just this week with um, some people who've been doing commercial work and it looks as though a lot of those disinfection bits and bobs are coming together to give certainly comparable results in the same kind of area. So that's quite heartening that a lot of that we can pull together and say, look, we're actually we're validating each other's work independently here. Yeah, yeah that, 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 that global uh, share of information and data is vital. I absolutely agree. Uh, one more question for you, Rajan, and I'll let you go for a second. Uh, um, have there been any links between particular cultivars? You know, um, like they were with uh, Pepino and Mosaic, of course. Uh, at the moment, it's still a bit too early to say because you've got th these kind of multiple dynamics of infection going on where quite often if you've got multiple varieties in a glass house, by the time you realise you've got a problem, you've got four potential varieties that it may be. Um, it's difficult to say that. So the, the Dutch have been doing some work, and I think we had a talk previously from uh, BART, and the, the Dutch plant health labs, um, and they've been picking up that that source tracking work, and they've taken they've had another release of that. And so hopefully, as that moves forward, and we get more and more outbreak uh, data feeding back into that source tracking, we'll be able to tease some of those patterns apart. Oh, that's that's really helpful. Thanks very much, Adrian. I'll give you a rest for a second and pick on you, Dave, if that's all right. Uh, um, just picking up on what I said to Adrian a moment ago, thinking of glutaraldehyde fogging, um, you mentioned really you don't want to have contractors in, but contractors surely to do some fogging would perhaps not be a bad idea, what do you think? Yeah, I think, you know, it's very easy to say don't have anyone in, just do it all yourself, don't allow visitors, but that's not really practical. So, I, I no, I would agree, um, you know, specialist equipment specialist skills you you probably would want to get people in to do things like that and if you've completely cleaned your your area down and and you're fogging then presumably things will be um will be cleaned through that anyway um so yeah it there's different risks for different um situations i guess and that probably is a, is a low risk one and, and and following on from that irrigation is the other one isn't it making sure you've got irrigation clean because you mentioned that irrigation might be a good way to or, or agent rather mentioned that irrigation is a good place to monitor perhaps going forwards but by the same token it's also an infection risk and we can't afford to replace all irrigation every year so we need to make sure we've got a robust policy for cleaning that too yep, absolutely brilliant thank you very much quick last quick question for you props up matthew um, Obviously, you, you've gone through a lot of details with what's happening uh, in, in, with U, UK legislation. Uh, is, there much, is it much com, um, cooperation globally uh, in, in the same vein? 
Yeah, um, so so obviously in terms, well, uh, for the UK, we're obviously very closely aligned with the EU, EU measures at the moment um, because we had to um, transpose the EU legislation into our own legislation. So they are following a, a very similar, um, similar similar regime and but and and tomato brown rico's fruit virus is being taken seriously by uh, a number of other countries and, and and to name obviously some some countries are putting in very um, stringent regulations in place such as australia which require far more far more testing of seed um sort of 20,000 seeds but that that but that also has resource implications and I noticed that there have been a couple of questions um, with respect to you know, the resource implications with regards to seed, um, and 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 why why we why we are doing this added testing at the border as a uh, when testing is being done by other countries coming in, um, but because of the risk, um, the as we're seeing more findings through findings through the uh, through the trade as you as you saw through the figures. Pepper, uh, tomato and pepper seed are extremely risky con risky consignments and yeah. while the measures being taken by other countries help and it's helpful to have this raft of measures through the five century certificates it's um not um it's, it's obviously not completely stopping the the entry of the virus and so we're taking these extra measures to try and improve the situation for uh, at the border brilliant Th th thank you very much, Martin. I mean, that, that links neatly to the paper we had before from, from AFA, doesn't it? And uh, the work that we're doing together to solve that particular problem. So thank you, for, thank you very much for that. I'm going to give you a quick opportunity if any one of the three of you want to make a quick last point before we wrap up. No, you're all smiling at me. Oh, yes, go on, Adrian. I almost got away with it then. Well, I've always got something to say, Phil. Um, I just noticed. Uh, Question from Richard in the comments saying, what's the point of testing plants at entry if you've got no detection for 49 days? That was in relation to mature plants being infected. In young plants, the detection is much, much quicker, uh, as, as quickly as 14 days. And my general advice would be routine, repeated testing is the best way to go, unless we can find another way to do it. But I appreciate that has a cost implication as well. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Adrian. That's, that's very helpful. Yeah, it's very difficult to pick out all this, all the questions. Otherwise, we'll be here for the next couple of hours, which demonstrates how important this subject is. Um, I therefore want to thank the three of you for the effort, the time you put into this today, and getting involved, and your continued work through the COBRA panel that we uh, will work together with the steering committee. Thank you very much for that, uh, and obviously also thank you to Deroyter for, for uh, sponsoring this this part of the conference. Uh, I'll leave you in peace. Thank you very much indeed, uh, gentlemen. Okay. I started today's event by saying that this is the most challenging year in my career. I think that's obviously still the case at the end of the day. However, we've had lots of conversations in lots of areas that have hopefully start the conversations to be able to find solutions to a lot of these challenges. Obviously, that started with Tim Pratt on, with energy, which is uh, a frightening increase in costs, uh, which is going to impact us for some time very clearly. Um, uh, hopefully, there's some little rays of sunshine in his discussion. This, his discussion. We then had a conversation with Lee Abbey uh, from NFU on labour, the challenges we've had there, and, and the com communication that we're having with government to try and solve some of the immediate problems there through visas, etc., and the challenges that COVID have brought to us. The Cantor... Uh, uh, the presentation was as good as ever, uh, which is always fascinating to see the figures of what's actually happening at, at the consumer level and through retail, um, followed by uh, the incredible impact that we've had this year with the uh, Tomato Fortnight uh, exposure and all the work we've done. Um, that's not goes, that goes without mentioning the, the, uh, the Lyca with the guys in the Northwest. Thank you for that, guys. Uh, um, I gave you a brief overview of the work that's happening with the Gorgas Butter Levy Group. One of the things I failed to mention was that it, it, I'm not just working with DEFRA, we're also working with the devolved authorities in Scotland and Wales, and we have complete UK-wide uh, 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 collaboration across sector there. So it's a really effective measure, and we will continue the work to make sure that we get applied funding funded 
and delivered going forward. Uh, it's my personal aim and assurance that I'm going to give you now that I'm going to continue to do that. Um, then we spoke with, uh, with our friends at uh, AFA on the, on the issues around the changes for post-Brexit at ports. Um, I hope you've come through to realise that the TGA is working very closely on your behalf to mitigate any negative impact of that uh, and we will continue to do that as you've seen and hopefully a number of you involved today will get involved in that uh, and help. I think the more people that get involved the better. Thank you for that. And then finally we just had a session uh, that uh, could leave us all feeling even more depressed which is this awful virus uh, which is threatening the whole industry. It isn't just threatening the UK of course, it's threatening us uh, uh, globally. However, we are working towards it. We need to take a positive view. We are a very robust industry. We are very open. We talk to each other and we share information. And as long as I'm involved in it, I'm going to help to make sure that happens. It's a phenomenal industry which I'm proud to be part of. And I want to make sure that uh, we don't all go home and uh, cry into our beer tonight. We are, there's lots of positive to take, lots of work to do. But I think a huge opportunity going forward, as there always is, and uh, we just need to uh, put our shoulder to the, to the wheel and push a bit harder at the moment to overcome these challenges. I'd like to thank all the speakers involved. Uh, it's not just the 15, 20 minutes that they spend talking to you on the conference. It's all the preparation that happens ahead of it. There's a lot of effort goes into that and the work that's happening in the background that they're talking about. So thank you all. Thank you also to our sponsors. Obviously, as I've said many times, this event does not happen without the involvement and support of the sponsors. And they were Botanico, Gautier and De Reuter. Thank you, the, the three of you, for that. Thank you also to our trade stand ex exhibitors, uh, all of which will be available on the expo area for the next 15, 20 minutes, so circa four o'clock. So any thoughts, any ideas, just have a quick look there whilst you're having a cup of tea this afternoon. Um, a quick reminder to complete the feedback form that's pinned on the top of the chat on the right hand side. It's in the reception area and then return to the reception desk. I say this every year, it is vital. We want to give you the conference and the content that you want. Uh, and if you tell us what you want, give, us, give the team half a chance to deliver on that, on that promise. Finally, thank you to everyone that's been involved. So all of you that are watching, over all your questions, uh, and I look forward to welcoming you next year. Again, as I said at the beginning, I hope with all my heart that it's a face-to-face -face and not necessarily just online, although we probably will have a lot of online con uh, content as well. Um, therefore, it was just a wish for me. All remains for me to do is to say thank you, take care, stay safe, and we'll see you all again next year. Thank you.